Bonnet. I'm with Blue On Energy, and today we're going to be talking about recovering refrigerant. I've brought on Jed Kennedy here to talk with me about this. So we're going to be going through some additional tr tricks and tips and uh, resources to help you with that. So Jed, can you tell us a little bit about what you do for Blue On and what your day-to-day -day looks like? Sure. Uh, I'm Jed Kennedy. I'm the director of technical services, as you said. Um, so we, as Blue On, the manufacturer, do things a little differently. We have our own in-house technicians. Uh, they do uh, conversions in the field with contractors, hands-on training on, on some of those larger systems. Uh, they provide technical support via phone or email. So if a contractor is having a problem, he can call us and he gets a real technician. Um, and we're also building an extensive database, an app that makes our lives a little bit easier. Great, great. That sounds exciting. Um, so to kick off this conversation about recovering refrigerant, I'd like to talk about the legal obligations you have when recovering refrigerant in the field. Sure. So EPA 608 dictates that uh, re when recovering refrigerant, you make good faith efforts to uh, not intentionally release refrigerant into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, now that doesn't include what is referred to as de, minis de minimis release. Um, okay. So if you're purging your hoses and getting air and non-condensables out of your hoses so you're not contaminating your system, that's okay. Um, there are leak check methods you can use to where you use a little bit of R22 to help find the leaks. That's okay. Um, but basically, you're not intentionally releasing refrigerants into the atmosphere. It's not a good thing. Right. That makes sense. Um, and so what are some of the methods you can use to recover this refrigerant? So there's really three primary methods that you can use. Um, there's vapor recovery, liquid recovery, and then the push-pull method. Um, the vapor recovery is, you know, probably suffices for smaller systems, but once you start getting into those larger systems, then you start using those other techniques. Okay. Is there a method you prefer to use or you would recommend um, our viewers to use? Um, it, it really depends on the system size. Uh, the very, very large systems, push-pull is definitely preferable. Uh, but in general, liquid recovers faster than vapor. Okay. Um, so, you know, be aware of that and try to recover as much liquid as possible before using vapor recovery if you're dealing with large refrigerant charges. Uh, just to get a sense of those recovery speeds, uh, look at your um, recovery machine manual and it'll mm -hmm. have you know, the recovery rate for vapor, the recovery rate for liquid, um, but in general it's about at least 10 times faster to pull liquid. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and what are some ways to reduce that recovery time? I know that's a big thing to actually be able to do that as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So the principles of a good recovery are largely the same as you know the principles of a good evacuation. Okay. Uh, it's pulling all those shredder cores, uh, using sh shredder core removal tools so that you can isolate the system, uh, using large diameter hoses, and minimizing your connections and using short hose lengths uh, just to make sure there's uh, less room for for leakage and you're just pulling a, as fast as recovery as possible. Absolutely, absolutely. And do temperatures affect how recovery time works? Sure, sure. So, you know, in the ambient condition extremes, uh, if it gets really hot, okay. um, your tank can get really hot and, and that will slow your recovery down. Uh, you can add a cool rag to that tank to cool it down. You can put in a, a bucket of ice water. Um, we like the CPS molecular transformator, uh, which is a subcooling device. It'll actually cool the refrigerant down as it recovers, and, and we've seen it reduce recovery time by as much as half. Wow, that's incredible. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what about cold temperatures? Do those have any effect? Yes, yes, they do. Um, good point. So as things get really, really cold, that refrigerant wants to stay trapped in that system, so it, the, the recovery machine has to work that much harder, harder and try to pull that recovery, mm -hmm. uh, that refrigerant out. So try to plan around those conditions uh, if possible. Don't do recoveries in really cold temperatures and really, really hot temperatures, but understandably, that's not always right. possible. <laughs> so keep to the middle if you can, yeah, but if, if you not, can. If you, use some of those methods. Yeah, if you live in southern sunny California, <laughs> you probably don't have that issue, but right. some guys have to right. work around those things. That makes sense. Um, and we haven't talked about third-party um, companies that can recover the refrigerant for you, but would you mind touching on that and when you would actually use that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, they're a very, very powerful resource for the industry right now. Um, as R22 goes away, it's going to become more important for guys uh, to be able to do, you know, these, these techniques very, very effectively mm -hmm. and quickly so that, you know, uh, they can keep their customers happy. Um, and third parties give you the option of, you know, outsourcing that work and labor, and they also pay you back the, for the refrigerant. So as the supply goes down, the prices will increase, will make your jobs more profitable by using those companies. Um, it's typically more applicable in large jobs with large systems, um, but they, you know, very effective tool to use for sure. Okay, that makes sense. So they have more than one benefit there, the cost, and then they can also help you recover it. Yeah, and they can also drive business to contractors. You know, if there's uh, downtime that there's not a lot of um, service calls happening, 
um, they can take a proactive step of getting R22 okay. out of systems that uh, can be converted to you know, R22 place, replacement like TDX20 so that customers aren't exposed to those rising R22 costs and they get an energy efficiency benefit with TDX20. Okay, cool. Um, so now I'm going to shift a little bit and I'd love to hear about some of the problems you might face out in the field um, while we're covering refrigerant. Sure. Um, if you get a little bit of moisture in your system for whatever reason, that can definitely cause problems. So, you know, when you're brazing in filter dryers or, you know, any any time you open up the system, uh, try to minimize any chance for there to be contaminants. Purge the hoses, um, flow nitrogen when doing any brazes, try to keep the system clean. That will reduce your recovery time and subsequently your evacuation as well. Right, that makes sense. Um, and do you have any other comments or suggestions for people out there right now um, while they're recovering refrigerants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say definitely utilize you know industry best practice in, in, in training like the one we're providing here uh, to really refine those skills that you've done many, many times, but will become more prevalent as R22 goes away. You know, not a lot of customers are ready to make the switch to the new equipment. Um, so, you know, retrofits will be, will be more and more of a um, a commonplace in the industry so you know take the time now to hone those skills and practice. Great um, that makes sense and why does recovering the refrigerant matter so much now is, is it really important um, for the industry? Yeah so I mean in, in the past R22 was widely available so if you had a leak you could just top off the system with R22 and things were good to go uh, but now as R22 becomes less available retrofits will need to happen more and more and so in that process, recovery and evacuation is critical. And make sure you do it right. That makes a lot of sense. Great. Thank you so yeah, much for no your problem. time, and we appreciate it. Thank you.